people who have spent 30 years in uniform, folks who have worked at the highest levels of government in the Trump administration to the Clinton administration are very concerned about the rise of domestic extremism. Any problem that exists in our society also exists in the U.S. military. The difference is that military veterans or folks in uniform have a lot of power compared to the average citizen. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. As we lead up to the election on November 5th, I want us to be realistic about what the reality of the days post-election are going to look like. I believe it's unlikely that Trump wins this election, but that doesn't mean he won't try to take this election. We've had Mark Elias on the show talking about Republican voter suppression efforts, election vigilantism, current and upcoming lawsuits that Republicans are filing and will continue to file in attempt to steal the election on behalf of their candidate. I've done rants explaining the cheating that is happening in red states across America, from trying to change the Electoral College in Nebraska, to insisting on hand counting the votes in Georgia, to mass purges of the voter rolls in Oklahoma, North Carolina, and Texas. As Mark said on the show a couple of weeks ago, plan on Trump and his team doing everything and anything to grab power against the will of the voters, and I think we need to expect to have a lot of people on board trying to help him do that. With that in mind, today's guest is Janessa Goldbeck. Janessa is the CEO of Vet Voice Foundation, a national nonprofit that advocates for veterans and military families to actively participate in our democracy. When she was a Marine Corps combat engineer officer, she led missions overseas and supported service members as a uniformed victim advocate. Janessa's activism includes challenging the combat exclusion policy and contributing to its repeal, which allowed all qualified applicants, regardless of gender, to serve in all military roles. Before serving in the military, Janessa led efforts to protect civilians in conflict zones as a human rights advocate. But we're having Janessa on the show today because she is also the mastermind behind the film War Game, which I had the pleasure of seeing at a special screening in L.A. and then hearing from the filmmakers, directors and participants back in May. War Game is a real life political thriller set on January 6, 2025, that imagines a nationwide insurrection in which members of the U.S. military choose to defect in order to support the losing presidential candidate, while the winning candidate and their advisors, played by an all-star group of former senior officials from the last five presidential administrations, deal with the crisis in a White House situation room. The participants have six hours to save democracy as the country teeters on the brink of civil war. This film dramatically shows us how this threat would play out in real time using a bipartisan group of U.S. defense, intelligence, and elected policymakers to participate in this unscripted role play exercise. So before we begin, I'm going to do something I've never done and play the trailer for the film to best prepare you for this important conversation. To be clear, this is not an ad. This is a conversation that needs to be had, and I want you best prepared to understand it. If you're listening to this podcast, feel free to go to Politics Girl YouTube to see the visuals, but I believe the audio speaks for itself. Now, here is the trailer for War Game. My fellow Americans, it is undeniable that this past election was stolen to all those members of the armed forces, join with us to defend our liberty and land. Seated around this room is an incredible diversity of professional experience spanning the last five presidential administrations. Most of you have sworn under oath to defend the Constitution. What happens when those in uniform break that oath? January 6th demonstrated a possible false sense of security. The next insurrection could involve members of the active duty military turning their weapons around on the folks that they are there to protect. One of the recommendations was to war game what that might look like. I am President Hotham, Chief Executive of the United States of America. You have six hours to avert a civil war and ensure the peaceful transfer of power. Mr. President, we are going to be starting the game in three. We are here to stress test our national security system. One. I want them to be prepared for the worst case scenarios. I have no idea if at the end of this exercise, this country collapses or comes together. Where would we like to send a large body of armed crazies? Capital. Capital. Who are confirming that there are National Guard that have in fact led protesters through. I'm gonna flood the zone with fake pictures, guys. Very difficult to find out what is real and what is. And there were actual images of them. It is not compromising the proceedings of the election. Yeah, it is compromising the proceedings of the election. The entire Congress is still in a bunker. 
because now they're playing the game. Everybody back to the table. You can authorize lethal force. Pause for just a second. Is that correct? You could have federal... We've done it on the southwest border. He's going to have to make a decision. Put your f***ing cards on the table. The United States could be on the brink of a second civil war. You've pissed off a lot of senior ranking folks from all five presidential administrations. It was my job. Great job. Yeah. And I'm back. So look, I'm talking about this film because if we're being honest, we need to acknowledge that the scenario this film addresses has a real possibility of playing out after the 2024 election. And the people at Vet Voice Foundation wanted to be sure we were as prepared as possible for what happens if the candidate who loses the election refuses to concede and some of our military, with support from paramilitary groups, many of them white nationalists or veterans, some of whom are the same people, take the losing side in an attempt to overthrow the results. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, former Marine, human rights advocate, and CEO of Vet Voice Foundation, Janessa Goldbeck. Welcome, Janessa. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. I have been looking forward to having you on the show since I saw the screening of War Game in LA. Not only is this just an absolute thriller and a great film, it is a giant warning to what is entirely plausible in this nation that is this politically divided with one candidate kind of ready to abandon democracy to return to power. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all you do to involve everyone in the conversation about politics and the future of this country. Yeah, it's so essential, right? I mean, it's we the people. We have to know what's going on. Now, the game that you set up in War Game, it portrays a fictional president of the United States and his advisors as they confront a political coup backed by rogue members of the U.S. military in the weeks after a contested 2024 presidential election. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this gamed out scenario wasn't created to be a film. It was meant to be a report. So tell me how the original idea was conceived and then how how it ended up being a film. Sure. Well, I am extremely privileged to get to lead an organization called Vet Voice Foundation. We're a national nonprofit. We represent about a million and a half vets and military family members across the country. And our mission is to elevate the voices of vets and military families in conversations that impact them in our democracy, whether that's issues that are more traditional veterans issues like health care and housing to things that really concern us because we're citizens, invested citizens of this nation, like the rise of extremism, domestic extremism here in our country and the slide towards authoritarianism that one of the major political parties in this country has taken. So after January 6th, we were shocked and alarmed like everyone uh, about the events of that day, but also noted that veterans were disproportionately represented in the people who took part in the insurrection on January 6th. One out of five of the folks charged in the January 6th insurrection were veterans, which is wildly disproportionate to our share of American society. So we wanted to raise alarm bells about extremism, both in our country and in the active duty military and National Guard. And to do that, we worked with a few general officers in our network to write an op-ed in the Washington Post that said, this is a real problem. It's not hysterical to call it out. The Pentagon needs to do something about it. And one of their recommendations was for there to be an interagency war game or tabletop exercise, which is something that's done very frequently in the military or in government, bringing together people who have held these roles or hold these roles in real life and have them work through a scenario that might seem sort of implausible at face value, but helps you understand some of the risks and vulnerabilities. And so that was our original intent, was to do that ourselves, bring together experts or people who had been in the highest levels of government, and do this scenario to tease out what are some of the things that we think are impossible here in our country, but actually are very plausible. And with bad actors or folks that have, you know, are intent on destroying or weakening democracy... What, what could they take advantage of? And so that was really the original intent of the scenario. Right, right. So the plan was to stage this war game type modeling, this tabletop situation of what we could reasonably expect might happen after the 2024 election, if it was close and the losing candidate, who we assume in this case would be Donald Trump, refuses to concede and members of the U.S. military decide to support him. The idea being 
what happens then? How do we plan for that? How do we react when violence starts spreading? What happens if the military fractures? What does the current president do to manage this escalating crisis and kind of defuse this coup without provoking a second civil war? So this war game was obviously very ambitious, but with the goal being to make sure that our government and our military were as well prepared as possible to defend the republic when it would be at its most vulnerable. So you're talking about this exercise being based on an editorial that was written in the Washington Post in 2021. That was written by three retired generals who were basically calling on the Defense Department to do this war game of this potential post-election insurrection slash coup attempt because they believed it was actually a real threat, right? That these high-level military veterans felt like a small number of active duty military might just refuse to obey orders of the lawfully elected commander in chief and instead obey the orders of the person they would prefer to be in that role. And the generals wrote in the post, and I'm going to quote them, that the potential for a military breakdown mirroring a societal and political breakdown was very real. So you guys decided to take up this challenge. How did you set up the war game itself? And then how did it become a film? You know, our first intent was to ensure that it was a nonpartisan or bipartisan exercise. We wanted sure. you know, we wanted to really make it clear that this isn't just Democrats who are anti-Trump trying to whip up hysteria or fervor, but that people who have spent 30 years in uniform, folks who have worked at the highest levels of government in the Trump administration to the Clinton administration are very concerned about the rise of domestic extremism. Any problem that exists in our society also exists in the U.S. military. The difference is that military veterans or folks in uniform have a lot of power compared to the average citizen. Veterans are one of the last groups in American society that have cross-partisan respect and appeal. So that makes us incredibly effective vectors for misinformation, disinformation. People listen when a veteran speaks. And so we really wanted to do something about it, but we wanted to ensure that it was very clear that this wasn't just about Donald Trump. It's about this new or growing movement in our country. Although it is a very, very small number of people, when you take a percentage of 330 million people, that's a lot of folks. And so we really wanted to highlight this without making it totally about Republicans versus Democrats. So we created an exercise that doesn't even bring either party into it. Uh, the candidates are fictional. But we recruited from the last five presidential administrations, folks like Senator Heidi Heidkamp, uh, Governor Steve Bullock of Montana, Elizabeth Newman, who was a Homeland Security, senior Homeland Security official in the Trump administration, uh, Bill Kristol, uh, Jack Tamarcio, who worked in the George W. Bush administration, just a huge spectrum of people across the divide who are very concerned about this issue in particular, especially if it were to bubble up at the tail end of a contested presidential election. And when we did this scenario in 2023, we didn't know that Trump was going to be the nominee of the Republican Party. At that point, he'd sort of faded from public consciousness. You remember DeSantis was on the rise and sort of the thinking was that Trump was, you know, a, a thing of the past. We didn't know that Project 2025 was going to be written down and put onto paper. And one major thing that this film examines is something called the Insurrection Act, which I'm sure we'll get into. And that's a big part of Project 2025. So you know, we were thinking about this issue outside of the lens of January 6th. Obviously, that was the impetus for the scenario. But we were thinking about it more in terms of what January 6th revealed as a vulnerability in our democracy and what uh, those who want to encourage more authoritarian politics in this country, ways they might exploit some of the normalcy bias that we have as Americans about what's possible here. Yeah. Normalcy bias for sure. And I should tell people that the group that Janessa is talking about who agreed to join this game did include Republicans, Democrats, people who identify as nonpartisan. The film ended up having two former U.S. Congress members, a former U.S. governor, a handful of retired generals and veterans of groups like the CIA, the FBI, the DHS, the DOD, and then people who were formerly military themselves. But your directors, as I understand it, after learning that this war game was happening, got in touch with you guys to see if you were opening to have a documentary made about the exercise. And then once they joined the team, the mission for the game expanded because 
the game had to remain the same for it to have the results you guys needed. But then you added filmmakers to the mix, right? And that changes how it's going to be done. So these filmmakers had six hours to capture this exercise in real time. And what we ended up getting from this film is this real life portrait of what was happening. But I know that you guys didn't want the people in the game to feel as if they were in a movie, right? Because you wanted them to feel like the, the, we needed to the results to be real for us to have a report that came out of this. So you needed the filmmakers to allow the game to play out as it would in real life, in real time, with the people involved not feeling self-conscious or aware of the cameras. So you built sets for the White House Situation Room, the briefing room, this red cell headquarters, and they were all inspired by real life and real world counterparts. But it maintained elements that allowed for the best way for the filmmakers to get their shots. Is that correct? Yeah, um, it was such an interesting project because anyone who's ever done a, a tabletop or a role play exercise like this, typically these things take place in like windowless conference rooms. They're very dry or you might have actually people in different parts of the country even zooming in. Very rarely, uh, at least in my experience, do they occur on a Hollywood movie set. It was really important for us when we were designing this exercise that we wanted to not just produce a report, but have some measure of public accountability, some way of bringing everyday Americans into this conversation. Because anyone who's ever worked in advocacy or in government knows that civil service organizations like ours provide reports and recommendations all the time about ways we think the government can be doing a better job. You know, sometimes those recommendations get enacted, but a lot of times there's a you know, like a, a feeling of thank you so much for this, like, we'll take a look and it goes into a drawer, or maybe a waste bin. And that's kind of the end of it. And so we wanted to do something a little bit bigger than this. So when we were approached by Jesse Moss and Tony Gerber, who are the film's co directors, about making a documentary, it was kind of hard for me to actually envision how that would take place. Because I'm thinking about my previous experience, which is a very boring room, <laughs> full of people just kind of pontificating about decisions they would make. And they had this incredible creative uh, genius idea to build a set, uh, build multiple sets actually in a hotel in Washington, D.C., where actually some of the insurrectionists had stayed on January 5th, the night before, January 6th, 2021, and to do it on January 6th. So the ghosts of sort of the, the, the previous insurrection were really hanging around our shoulders as the participants walked into the hotel, you know, CNN was on, the hearings were happening. I was concerned it would kind of make things feel almost cartoonish or that the participants would be more reserved because they would be aware of the cameras. But the way that Jesse and Tony designed the sets, you know, there was a 50 plus person crew that day with multiple cameras, everyone was mic'd. And yet, as soon as they hit the red button and that six hour countdown began, all of the participants, like they were locked in. The, the crew kind of melted into the, the background. And so it was very thoughtfully designed in a way that really, I think, actually added gravitas to the day and enabled the role players to really envision themselves in the room, in the situation room. I can see that because having seen the film, which I highly recommend everyone go and see, it really feels like a thriller, like it was a fictional story, except it is a true role play of what could really happen in our government. And I think what you're talking about, this kind of measure of public accountability that we don't often see these reports or things that are, are produced for our government. The public doesn't see this kind of accountability. And often, like you said, it ends up in a drawer. In this case, uh, although it is a report, it ends up in front of our eyes and we see what the government really has to contend with, what they really are dealing with. And in this case, we're talking about, do we go into the Insurrection Act and do we sort of declare that, which is a huge move for the American government to do that. I mean, Donald Trump is ready to do it every single freaking second because he just wants to call the military on his own people. But that is a major move for a government to call. And that is sort of what we're looking at in the film. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Insurrection Act and, and sort of how that plays in this film, but also how that plays in American government? So getting older is no joke. Every time I take a picture these days, I have to be aware of where the lighting is or what I look like because otherwise I'm all crinkles and eye wrinkles and it's terrible. But at least today's sponsor has my back. Look, I can't get too exercised about aesthetics, but I do want to keep my skin as healthy as possible as I get older. Did you know that your body starts accumulating sentient cells, also called zombie cells, as early as your 20s? These little zombies stop producing collagen and hyaluronic acid like they used to and start secreting an inflammatory substance that makes their neighboring cells dysfunctional as well. But there's an answer for this, and it comes from our friends at OneSkin. 
Founded by an all-woman team of scientists, OneSkin is the first and only skin longevity company to target cellular sentience, a key hallmark of aging, and their proprietary OS1 peptide. OS1 is the scientifically proven to decrease lines and wrinkles, boost hydration, and help with thinning skin that often comes with age. There's a reason they have over 400 five-star reviews for their full line of face, body, sun, and travel size products. Treating symptoms rather than the root cause of aging has long been the norm. Most skincare available on the market is designed to provide a temporary reduction in visible signs of aging, addressing the surface symptoms rather than the underlying decline in the skin health. One Skin, on the other hand, believes the purpose of skincare is not just to improve how we look, but to optimize our skin's biology so that it's more resilient to the aging process. It's next level skincare. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code politicsgirl at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code politicsgirl. And after you purchase it, if they ask you where you heard about them, please support the show and tell them that we sent you. Oneskin.co. I was so excited when Calm approached us to sponsor the show because I have been using Calm for years. Calm is the number one brand for sleep, meditation, and relaxation, giving you the power to calm your mind and change your life. I've had a lot of trouble sleeping over the years, and I found Calm because I had heard about their sleep stories. I've now got a curated list of sleep stories that I listen to almost every night. At this point, I literally make it less than a couple of minutes into one before I'm out. My brain is trained to hear them and go to sleep. There are a number of sleep stories I actually don't even know how they end, truly, after years of using them. Sean got upset with me last time I talked about Calm because I said he goes to sleep every night with their wind in the pine soundscape, and apparently he actually goes to sleep with the green noise with river soundscape, so apparently I don't know him at all. And yes, he's joking, but it's not a joke that we both use Calm. Calm even has grounding exercises. If you're feeling overwhelmed, meditations for different emotions, short guided sessions, breath work, and expert-led talks designed to help you handle things like grief, improve self-esteem, or work on your relationship. It's just all right there on your phone. So stress less, sleep more, and live better with Calm. For listeners of our show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash politicsgirl. That is C-A-L-M dot com slash politicsgirl for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash politicsgirl. I really do use this app every single day. It's a game changer. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Insurrection Act and, and sort of how that plays in this film, but also how that plays in American government? Yeah. So the Insurrection Act is an authority that the president of the United States has that allows them to deploy the U.S. military or the National Guard domestically. Um, typically, we don't use the military in a law enforcement capacity. We don't use the military domestically. But this authority exists so that the president, you know, in the it's in the name, uh, can quell a domestic insurrection. And in the past, it's been used to deploy troops in places like Kent State or Waco, Texas, or the Rodney King riots, um, all of which are instances that have had huge political ramifications for decades to come. And it is an important power for the president to be able to have, but it also has very few checks and balances. It is a, a almost unilateral authority that the president has. And so it's important for the president to be able to have that power potentially, but in the wrong hands can also be used in a very terrifying way. And in fact, we've seen that actually outlined in Project 2025 since uh, we did this scenario in Project 2025, the recommendation is for the next president of the United States to use the active duty military and deploy them into the cities and states of political rivals. So in a Trump administration, that would be uniformed troops on the, on the streets of San Francisco and Chicago and Washington, D.C., seeing the military de deployed domestically in a way that has never been seen in my lifetime or, or several generations before mine. In addition, Project 2025 calls on the president President Trump to use the Insurrection Act to deploy the military domestically to deport people who are supposedly here illegally. Uh, again, a huge break in our expectations as citizens of what we use our military for, what we ask them to do. And so we had no idea, again, when we created this scenario that this was going to be part of our contemporary discourse, that the Insurrection Act would really take such an outsized role in the 2024 presidential election. But it certainly has, because they've 
put down on paper how they plan to use this authority in a way that has not been seen. And, you know, I think it's frankly a, a bit terrifying and uh, certainly something that most Americans would not be in favor of. Right. Yeah. No, it's completely terrifying. I think that's the perfect word for it to sort of unleash the American military on Los Angeles, New York, Washington, D.C., to keep the people where you want them to be. That's not what our military was meant for. And it certainly wasn't meant to work against its own people. But this is where we're at now. I mean, you're, you did this war game essentially to assess weaknesses and vulnerabilities within our political system in order to prepare our democratic institutions and political and military leaders to best confront and manage such a crisis should and if it arrive. And I believe that you did send a confidential written analysis of the game to key personnel in the United States government when you were done. Is that correct? We did, yes. Okay, good. So the idea is, I mean, your organization in general, Vet Voice Foundation, you're veteran-led for veterans, but your core mission seems to be to protect democracy and the constitutional rule of law. So it must feel very personal to you to run this war game with the idea that your fellow brothers and sisters in arms might not defend the Constitution, but rather follow and defend a presidential candidate who would seek to destroy it. I mean, listening to Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who plays an important advisor role in this film and in this game, she said... She describes this game and what is ultimately this film as coup prevention 101, as a way to be prepared for something that might happen. But I'm sure it feels very personal to you. It absolutely does. Um, one, because uh, because of what I mentioned earlier, the sort of outsized respect that everyday people have for veterans. You know, we are disproportionately targeted for recruitment into extremist groups because those groups understand the value of having veteran validators, folks like convicted felon uh, General Michael Flynn, who became an important leader in the Stop the Steal movement four years ago. And so that deeply concerns me. It also deeply concerns me as somebody who, you know, I served in uniform for seven years as a Marine Corps officer. And the idea that my friends, my family who are still serving would be misused in such a way by by future President Trump, um, deployed against their neighbors and friends. This is something that is, you know, deeply personal to me because these are real people to me. I know I know people who are still in uniform. And I also believe that we're in a time right now where there's so much misinformation. The media ecosystem is so disparate. Everybody is getting sort of self-perpetuating stories. You know, if you believe in a certain ideology, it's very rare to kind of read or be exposed to something outside of that. And we're all subject to that sort of isolationism in our media diet. And it's uh, really important for everyday Americans, regardless of your political ideology or affiliation or, or what you believe is real, to consume media outside of our, our you know, our little bubble and to expose ourselves so that when something happens, uh, like an insurrection on Capitol Hill or an election result that you disagree with, you have a, a sense of skepticism, I guess, of of one particular ideology. That's that's also like kind of dangerous too, I guess you could say, like if I flip the script around and looked at it from a different perspective, you might say, well, that skepticism is what brought us here. Uh, but we know for a fact that we have so much disinformation in our ecosystem that not only do we have folks domestically who are seeking, you know, to push us in a more authoritarian way, but we have foreign actors, Russia, China, Iran, that are filling our media ecosystem and social media with content that's meant to divide us and pour gasoline on uh, partisan division. And so I think we all just need to be a bit more responsible in how we consume and perpetuate information. And really, this country only survives if we all believe in democracy and the rule of law and work to make that stronger. There's a lot of, a lot of entities out there right now that would love to see us tear ourselves apart. Absolutely. I mean, and I think I should be clear to people that this isn't a film for us to watch and just fall into despair. This is a film that is starting a conversation about what we need to be prepared for and what's coming. So it's both a documentary and a call to arms. Like we need to understand that our democracy is incredibly fragile right now, but it relies on us, the people to do the right thing. So this is all about preparing people for the possibility of a reality that most of us can't even fathom, but more specifically for preparing the sitting government right now for what they might face in the days after the November election. Now, you had... Ben Rad from Fascination Labs, who created the game, on the stage after the screening that I saw in Los Angeles. And he posed the question, 
How do stable societies become unstable? With the idea being that a lot of our problems stem from a lack of imagination, that we as Americans simply can't imagine something like a coup, something like an insurrection, something like the military being used against our own people really happening. We hear that like Project 2025 wrote down that they're going to go into liberal cities and kind of like you know, make us behave, but we can't really imagine that happening. So we're not prepared if it, if and when it does, right? And this game seems to have been conceived as a type of preparation for that. You were talking about normalcy bias, right? Like, I think it's fair to say that a lot of us were gaslit about what happened on January 6th. A lot of people do not understand. Now it's just a moniker, J6, like it was something cool, right? Like it was a terrifying moment in American history. And I think the idea of this film is to prepare us for what might happen again, but also to make sure it doesn't happen again, that we have to be really aware of combating misinformation in real time. You were talking about Elizabeth Newman, who is a former national security expert who worked in Republican administrations, and she's in the game. And we have actually had her on the show talking about her book. She's an amazing uh, expert in, in national security. And she said, it's really important to watch this film in order to awaken the exhausted majority, that we can't just let our government and our democracy be taken over and then realize how special it was, right? This film kind of lights a fire in in the people who watch it to see that this country is worth fighting for, that these are real possibilities. But when we lose faith in each other, we're going to lose the battle. So we really need to kind of back it up a bit, not be depressed about it, but really know that we need to prepare for what might come. Being a super busy person, it doesn't matter how handy I am, or let's be honest, how handy Sean is. We just don't have the time to get stuff done. We definitely need new blinds in our house, but we also need someone to come in and help us out with it. Which is why I'm happy that there is a better way to buy blinds, shades, shutters, and drapery, and it's called 3-Day Blinds. 3-Day Blinds are the leading manufacturer of custom window treatments in the US, and right now they're running a buy one, get one 50% off deal. We can shop for almost anything from our home, so why not blinds? 3-Day Blinds has local, professionally trained design consultants who have an average of 10 plus years of experience to provide you with expert guidance on the right blinds from the comfort of your own home. Just set up an appointment and you'll get a free, no obligation quote the same day. Check out 3-Day Blinds on Instagram. They've got some great looks. Maybe it's 2024 and you're thinking, well, my whole house is smart. Why aren't my blinds? Well, 3-Day Blinds can hook you up with blinds that connect to your smart house. Alexa, open blinds. Or if that's not up your alley, get motorized blinds or roller shades or Roman shades. No matter your unique need, from room darkening to child safety, with 3-Day Blinds, you get to choose from thousands of options that fit any budget and style with actual samples that won't leave you guessing about how they will look. As I said, right now you can get a three-day blinds, buy one, get one 50% off deal on custom blinds, shades, shutters, and drapery. For a free, no charge, no obligation consultation, just head to 3dayblinds.com slash politicsgirl. That's buy one, get one 50% off when you head to 3dayblinds.com slash politicsgirl. One last time, that's the number three, D-A-Y, blinds.com slash politicsgirl. So... If you listen to this podcast, you know that I'm a busy person and I love finding little ways to make my life easier. And one thing I can tell you I do not have time for these days is shopping. And I know I'm not alone, which is why I'm pleased to partner with Daily Look. Daily Look is the highest rated premium personal styling service for women. With Daily Look, you get your own dedicated personal stylist to create a box of clothes based on your body shape, preferences, and lifestyle. You start by filling out a style quiz, including your price and lifestyle preferences, and then you get up to 12 hand-selected items delivered to your home, and what you love, you keep, and you send the rest back. This isn't an algorithm. There are real people picking out these clothes for you and you'll get the same stylist every time so they get to know what you like and what your sizes really are. Are you dressing for the office, for preschool drop-off? Is your wife or girlfriend hating their clothes but too busy to redo their wardrobe? Then you might wanna check out Daily Look. And before your box comes, you get to edit it. So if you already know something in there isn't for you, you can take it out. And your box is peppered with both established brands like Kate Spade and AG to new up and coming designers with sizes for almost everybody from zero to 24. It might be time to get your own personal stylist with Daily Look. Head to dailylook.com to take your style quiz and use code politicsgirl for 50% off your order. Once again, that's dailylook.com for 50% off and make sure you use my promo code politicsgirl so they know I sent you. How closely do you track your bank statements and credit card transactions? I honestly know I don't do it enough and I should. 
How many transactions do you think you make a month? I was shocked to learn that the average U.S. consumer makes an average of 70 payments a month, which is why keeping track of our spending can be overwhelming, and it's where Rocket Money comes in. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that empowers you to save more, spend less, and take control of your financial life. Rocket Money makes it so much quicker and easier to stay on top of your finances. With Rocket Money, you can see all of your checking, savings, credit cards, and investments in one place, allowing you to understand your spending trends. Rocket Money can also help you set up a custom budget to identify top spending categories and suggesting areas where you could adjust your spending habits. They'll calculate your monthly spending allowance and alert you when you're close to going over budget, like if you've gone a little crazy on the food delivery or clothes that month. They also have a goals feature that automatically saves money for you so you don't even have to think about it. Whether your goal is to pay off your credit card debt, save money for a house, or simply save, Rocket Money makes it easy, which is probably why Rocket Money has over 5 million happy members and saved its users over a billion dollars across all the app's features. So let Rocket Money help you reach your financial goals faster. Get Rocket Money today at rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. That's rocketmoney dot com slash politics girl r-o-c-k-e-t money dot com slash politics girl when we lose faith in each other we're going to lose the battle so we really need to kind of back it up a bit not be depressed about it but really know that we need to prepare for what might come that's right you know rolling stone called this the scariest movie of the year um yeah and i think it, it, it is yeah in, in many that's a great ways. yeah absolutely <laughs> but it's also i think a very hopeful film and one of the things i'm proudest about what the film conveys is you know we don't as americans often see behind the scenes of what's happening in our government and we usually only really pay attention when things have gone terribly wrong and what this film depicts is you know over 30 people who have spent their careers either in uniform or on Capitol Hill or in state and local government who come from all different, you know, political ideologies. Like the idea that I would count Elizabeth Newman, a former, you know, Republican Trump administration official is one of the people I respect and admire the most, you know, a couple of years ago that would have blown my mind. But the the reality is that all of these people, despite our po- particular beliefs on different policies and issues, we share a commitment to our constitution and to the continuance of our experiment in American democracy. And that is bigger than any of our sort of individual political beliefs. And so what you see depicted in War Game is these folks coming together to have principled, thoughtful conversation about what's best for the American people, for the country, not about themselves, not about their own political power or profile, and really working through this incredibly complicated, scary, and tense scenario to come out on the right side of history and to you know ensure that people have faith in our democratic systems. And so that to me is very inspiring. We don't often see that. Uh, We don't often get a chance to kind of see real people who have spent their lives in this way, working in this manner together. And so I hope people will take away away from that, how important it is to have that kind of dialogue, to have that kind of respect. And, you know, I think one of the things that most people who've never served in uniform don't maybe don't know about the military is when you, you know, raise your right hand and you swear an oath to support and defend the constitution, you do that despite, you know, you know, you're going to be in some tough situations, you're going to be just you're uncomfortable, you're going to have to go places and maybe do things that are really hard um, and really scary. And you're going to have to do it alongside people who might be incredibly different than you. You know, I, I, I before I was in the Marine Corps, I worked as a human rights advocate, I specifically worked in genocide and mass atrocity prevention. So I have been in countries where citizens have turned against each other. And I know how real that is. But in the Marine Corps, you know, not a lot of my peers were former human rights activists. I grew up in Southern California. A lot of but my peers grew up in the Midwest. You know, I'm openly gay. A lot of these folks had never met a gay person before that they knew of. You know, so it was a it, it is definitely a place where you have to put those things aside and say, look, we're all wearing the same uniform. We all are here in service of a common cause and we're gonna row in that direction together, regardless of our individual political beliefs. And that can be really, really challenging when somebody's politics are directly, you know, a a threat to your physical safety or your rights. I'm not going to sugarcoat that for sure. But having that sort of baseline sense of who we are, we were all Marines uh, when we were, you know, getting on that boat or whatever it was, wherever we were going. 
And we are all Americans, despite our uh, very different political beliefs. And I really hope that we can do more, um, have more challenging conversations uh, with our friends and family that are really based in empathy and respect. I don't think without that connection, this country has a, a whole lot of time left. But I do think this country does if we can kind of really invest in those relationships between our citizens. Yeah. Remind ourselves we're all on the same team, that we're all wearing the uniform of America and we really need to find a way to come together here. I mean, one of the things that struck me watching this film was how asymmetric this war would actually be because the side seeking power without justice, the side that didn't win, the side that decides to go against the Constitution, they were able to lie indiscriminately. But the government, if it wants to function as a government in the future, has to deal in truth, which in your film put them really on a back foot when it came to social media and how fast they could respond. And it didn't really feel like a fair fight. And yet that would be one that they would still need to win. I mean, to me, if anything, this film is such a huge reminder not to take, as you were saying earlier, social media at its word, to do your research, to triple check things, especially in a crisis when things are moving quickly. If you see something that says the American government is shooting at these people, you must check other sources, particularly I often say foreign sources, check with CBC in Canada, check with BBC in, in, the, in the UK, people that wouldn't be directly involved in either side. I mean, again, Elizabeth Newman, who's a security expert, she said, we can't just wait for the administration to save us, that we clearly are going to need new laws around social media, but we can't wait for them to make those laws. What we have to do right now is the hard work of using critical thinking and holding each other accountable and not just sharing things, making sure they're real before we do that. And I think that's one of the reasons that watching this film is so important because it allows us to start a conversation of how quickly something could unravel and how we would pay a part in that. We, the American public, just on our phones, right? Right. And I think you see this film and you realize this is something we really need to be talking about. Yeah, I, I, our director, one of our directors, Tony Gerber, uh, calls the film a provocation for a conversation. And I, I think that's exactly what I hope it achieves. You know, we were very fortunate to be in, in limited theatrical release over the last couple of months. We were in over 50 cities theatrically and we're this fall doing an imp what we're calling an impact tour. So we're going to about, as of right now, 50 colleges and universities around the country with an emphasis on swing states and rural parts of the country that don't maybe necessarily get a theatrical release in their town to bring the film to them to have these, you know, to start these conversations and involving local policymakers, journalists, et cetera, in the sort of conversation afterwards. Because I really do think that the more isolated we are from each other, the easier it is to breed division. And when you can get people in rooms together rather than, you know, in a chat room or online, it, it's a lot harder to sling stones and arrows from a real person sitting across from you. And even if you, you know, despise each other's politics, you know, maybe you both like the same hot dish. I don't know. But I do think having more of that in-person connection is really important. And we're we're just at a time right now where it's so easy to be isolated from each other. I mean, the, the Surgeon General of the United States has declared loneliness an epidemic in this country for the first time, which I think is pretty remarkable. And really, you can't separate that sense of isolation, a sense of loneliness from these conversations, because people are drawn to extremist groups, they're drawn to extreme ideology, because they're looking for that connection. And I think that's a very important point that can sometimes get lost in the, the rhetoric around extremism and democracy. Yeah. And it doesn't help that people like Elon Musk, who, you know, used foreign money to buy something like Twitter and turn it into X, are really pushing so hard every day to divide us more. I mean, I actually feel terrified when I look at Twitter these days because he's making such a solid attempt to make us hate each other. And that's with a purpose. He has yeah. a goal in which to do that. And he was allowed to buy that uh, social platform in order to do this very thing. You know, I don't understand why the wealthiest man in the world can't afford therapy, but we would all benefit from, <laughs> from that. <laughs> it's so depressing. Well, listen, I really want people to watch this film. I mean, not only is it an absolutely brilliant documentary and shout out to your directors because they just killed it, but it also plays like a dystopian thriller. It is a very exciting film. It's a very uh, edge of your seat film. And it acts as this kind of glaring warning for our nation. I mean, clearly what plays out in this film is entirely plausible in America. And we really have to understand that. From your position, what was your biggest takeaway making the film and doing the game? 
I think I underestimated how hungry people were to talk about this issue. You know, like you said earlier, we were, we have been gaslit about January 6th. You know, the, there were a couple of days right after where regardless of your party affiliation, people were willing to call out what we all saw with our own two eyes. And now it's like you said, it's like they're talking about it as tourists in the Capitol. I think we have 147 members of Congress who believe that the election, the 2020 election was stolen. Members of Congress. And there is a, a huge percentage of people in this country who believe that as well. And many, by the way, I should add many of those members of Congress who won on exactly the same ticket that they're saying was fraudulent, right, which of course exactly. makes no yeah, sense. The, yeah. the logic is not particularly the logic's linear, not but there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the math isn't mathing. But all of that, you know, all of that is is really concerning. I think so many of us have been sitting with this anxiety bottled up. Or you have a family member like I do, I discuss in the film who has gone down a QAnon conspiracy theory rabbit hole and really like lives in a completely different reality than I do. And we're struggling with that. We're, we're dealing with it, it. It creates this existential dread about what is happening. I mean, my wife and I were, were talking about whether we're going to take a vacation later this year. And we were like, well, I, it kind of depends on the election results, which is a crazy thing to say. But I think so many of us are sitting with that kind of fear and dread and are looking for an off ramp or a way to talk about it. And so I really hope that this film provides the starting point for that conversation that isn't sort of coded in a right versus left, Democrats versus Republican way, but actually lays clear the stakes of this next election and what's at stake for our democracy. Exactly. I mean, it's really tough when you watch people in your life who have gone down a rabbit hole because it's hard to pull them out. And I think it will start with common sense, common ground conversations. Like you said, maybe we start at we like the same football team and then we move forward from there. But I feel like this film allows you not a left or right perspective, but an American perspective to watch how it would play out and how much the acting government in this film does not want to do the Insurrection Act because it really is such a bold move to use use the military against your own people and how hesitant a president really should be to invoke that. And I think we should be aware that if one presidential candidate is very keen to use it, that should be some warning lights for all of us. So I really want to thank you for joining us today, Janessa. Sadly, this is a terrifying but entirely plausible scenario for America right now. And a war game type situation like this is a really proactive way for us to you know, get prepared for such a situation. This is essential in this time of domestic extremism and hyperpolarization that we, the people, take on the responsibility of defending our democracy from those who would seek to destroy it. And it's up to us to stand up for our country, to have these tough conversations, to have conversations in general, even when we feel like, ah, I can't. You kind of have to at this point, even just start with common ground, start with conversation, start with curiosity, and maybe start with watching this film together or separately and then talking about it together and seek truth and facts because we know those are truly under attack. So please tell people how they can watch this film and how they can support the good work of Vet Voice moving forward. Well, we are uh, thrilled to be on streaming platforms as of uh, Friday. So you can find War Game on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Fandango, Google Play, YouTube, and then on a variety of broadcast options as well. We're also touring the country, as I mentioned earlier, uh, bringing the film to communities. And if you'd like to request a screening, you can do so on our website, which is wargamefilm.com, or you can find a screening, a theatrical screening or otherwise, on that website as well, wargamefilm.com. But I just want to say thank you so much for having me on the on the pod. Thank you so much for uh, coming to see the film. Uh, we're we're just so eager for Americans to have a chance to engage with this topic in a in a productive way. And you know, sometimes folks say, "Well, this was a lot. Like this is very overwhelming. What can I do as one person?" I truly believe because I've seen it with my own eyes that change starts with one person taking one action and building from there. So if you you know are willing to have a tough conversation great. If you're willing to go knock doors for a pro-democracy candidate, even better. But our democracy is a contact sport. It only works when we all are on the field. So really encourage folks to to get involved in the, the, the next couple of weeks before the election's over. Absolutely. And thank you for your service, Janessa. Thank you for this film. And thank you for working for Vet Voice because it's obviously just a spectacular organization. So everyone go watch War Game because we need to know what we're up against. And then we need to find our way back to each other moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks again. 
So that was Janessa Goldbeck reminding us that we need to be prepared, that we are at a very fragile time in American history. And although that might make us feel powerless, we are not. We have to be critical thinkers, check our sources and do the work now in these final days leading up to the election to make sure those who will fight for democracy in the American experiment will win in November. Have the conversations, knock on doors, get people registered. And if you can see Wargame and share it with others, do it. The more prepared we are for what's coming, the better prepared the American experiment will be to safely come out the other side. I want to thank Janessa for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go to wargamefilm.com or any streaming service and watch this important piece of public accountability. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.